Hello, you're listening to the State of Startups with Industry Analysts. We shine a light on the interplay of startups, their ecosystem, and industry analysts in the B2B tech space. That is, real experiences from real people solving the same challenges that you're dealing with, too. You're hosted by Chris Holscher and Robin Schaefer. Enjoy this session. Hey, Robin, so this is it. Hey, Chris, we recorded the first episode of the SSIA interview series. I guess we should quickly explain what this is all about. Yeah, this is so exciting. This is so exciting. So, dear audience, um, you may or may not be familiar with the SEER research project that Robin and I undertook with the University of Edinburgh in 2022, so last year. Um, well, um, SEER, SSIA, stands for the State of Startups with Industry Analysts, as you can uh, read somewhere up here. Um, and, and it was all about um, examining precisely that. So, how do startups in the B2B tech space actually work with industry analysts today? Uh, what value do they get? How do they approach it? What are they struggling with? How do they organize their analyst relations work? And what investment is behind it and plans for the next year and also on all that? And vice versa, how do analysts see this? What are their motivations? What kind of approaches work for them or not? And when do they want to speak to startups? And what should startups focus on, et cetera? Yeah, exactly. So so we got a ton of data. And verbatims via the comment fields and our follow-ups. Yeah, yeah, lots of comments and follow-ups, right. And and that led us really to realizing um, uh, we should make all these good conversations uh, visible and, and audible to the startup world. Um, so um, frankly, frankly, also to the analyst world, because clearly there is a gap to close here. And, and there is an opportunity um, on both sides to benefit more from, from getting together. And voila, here's episode number one of the State of Startups with Industry Analysts interview series. Ta-da! And, and we've, got, we've got a great guest um, as our interview partner number one. Yeah, we, got, we spoke to Adam Coughlin. Adam is a co-founder and the CMO for York IE. And that's an unusual organization. They provide strategic tr strategic advisory and investments for startups. They're from Manchester, New Hampshire in the U.S. And I'd say they're in the mid-range in terms of size. Yeah, uh, um, 75 startups, I believe, Adam said. And and um, they're currently they're currently working with 75 startups, I believe, he said. Yeah, right. Well, but let's not jump ahead and reveal too much. Adam's got a really rich background with industry analysts from former roles in larger organizations, as well as lots and lots of startups from very early stages of Series A, Series B investments. And he shared a lot of insights. Yeah, indeed. And, and what I found really interesting in the interview was how Adam said right from the start, basically, that the entire interplay between startups and analyst firms, in his view, is really ripe for some evolution. I agree. And that's really what this is all about. So well, let's let's dive right in, and here's our first interview with with Adam Coughlin from York IE. So another installation of the C interview series. I see Robin Schaffer, I see myself, and I see a man called Adam Coughlin. I don't know who you are. Um, Robin um, brought you on the show. So Adam. Who are you and why are we talking with you about the state of startups with industry analysts today? Uh, excellent. Yeah, so my name is Adam Coughlin. I am the uh, chief marketing officer and co-founder of York IE. Uh, and I've spent the last 10 years uh, in B2B tech uh, at enterprise, midsize and small companies. So I've seen sort of the analyst uh, industry from every angle possible. And I feel like uh, uh, the whole model is ripe for disruption. So I'm really excited to talk about that with you guys today. Great, great. Okay, so, York IE. <laughs> yeah, tell us about York IE a little bit more. Yeah, so York IE is a strategic growth and investment firm. So we help companies, uh, technology companies grow. And we do that through two primary ways. We have a B2B SaaS investment early stage syndicate uh, where we actually invest money into companies uh, over the last three years. I think we've done somewhere around 40 different investments. Uh, and then we have an advisory services offering where we help companies um, kind of act as operational extensions of their team in four core functions, corporate strategy and FP&A, 
product strategy and product development, brand strategy and uh, marketing communications and go-to-market strategy and rev ops. Nice. Um, so, yeah. You have a great team. I've met some of your folks and they're really strong and love the way that they support these uh, emerging companies with their expertise. And and how many how many startups do you serve at, at the moment? Uh, so yeah, so from a client perspective, I think we have around 75 clients. Nice. And, and it's a really nice model because, um, you know, we, there's obviously a bunch of companies that we just work with on the advisory services side, really trying to help them grow. Uh, but then we also work with a lot of the companies that we invest in as well, too. And they know, um, you know, from a vendor perspective, we are incentivized by their long term success and really want them to be successful. And they also know that we have skin in the game uh, as nice. we're trying to help them grow. Now, do people graduate from your program or do you go with them as they grow? Do you grow with them as they grow? I guess is my. Yeah, favorite. I think that like, uh, you know, we we started the company in 2019. Uh, so we are in ourselves a, a startup, which I think is one of the important uh, distinctions for us is that we, we really want to be that operational uh, help to the team. We want to be like, an, we, we view investment from an operator's lens versus just an investor's lens. And every problem that say one of the companies that we're working with on the marketing side has, I have trying to do the marketing for my own company getting off the ground, right? So right. all of our advice is really from the school of uh of hard knocks of today and is relevant and not uh, necessarily, um, you know, from past success 10, 15 years ago, which in technology might as well be a million years ago. Or, or just <laughs> theoretical. Or just, or just, right, exactly, in an ivory tower somewhere. Mm. Right, cool. And where would you say, um, Adam, is the, the majority of your uh, your clients in, in terms of their life cycle? Are they, you know, where, where, where do you start and where's the majority in, in terms of, you know, pre-seed, seed, series A, B. Yeah, so as to, um, from the, you know, uh, I mean, our early customer base on the advisory side was our investment pipeline. And so those are obviously in the seed to series A sort of stage as yeah. we've matured as a company uh, to Robin's point, as we've begun to figure out how do we provide value as that company grows and evolves. I always like to say that like in the beginning, we're sort of like a Swiss army knife because uh, we can do a lot of different things for a company. But as that company grows, and they hire some of those talents in-house, we become a world-class spoon or fork. And so we do have a client base that's um, probably in that scale-up stage. Um, so that's kind of the combination of the two. Got it. Right. Got it. So so uh, just switching to now industry analysts. So how do you see industry analysts playing with your startup, your, your group, your members, your community? Yeah, so to... Um, to, to Chris's point, for a lot of the, the early stage um, companies that we work with, um, very little involvement. Mm -hmm. and, and I think part of the reason is, is that these companies, a startup fundamentally uh, is born because they feel that the status quo is broken, right? And so they want to disrupt that. And they usually disrupt that by taking a little bit of this and a little bit of that and putting it together and kind of creating a new paradigm, right? And so every startup that I talk to um, says, oh, I think we're probably uh, creating a category, right? And so by that, by that nature, they're already, before they've even begun, created a bit of an adversarial relationship yep. with the analyst community because they're already saying like, okay, well, you know, a lot of the sort of buckets and the lanes that they've created are wrong and we think that they should be changed, right? And then they don't necessarily know the best route to go and, and have that conversation. And so they don't. Which, by the way, is super interesting to analysts who have created all these old existing categories because they love to be challenged on this. It might not always, you know, result in, oh, yeah, let's throw everything away and do everything new. But um, it's just part of the game to constantly evolve and challenge their own thinking. And so a startup that believes they are all about creating a new category is certainly super interesting to an analyst because it challenges their thinking. And uh, at least that's what we heard, Robin, from, from the CS survey um, yeah. over and over again. Um, yeah, we heard that. And I think actually, personally, I think the analysts, the many analysts have participated in the CS survey, several hundred. Um, because of the nature that they participated in the survey, 
they may be more conscious of and aware and in, and inviting of, of uh, startup disruptive ideas. Because I kind of have found from my experience again, that there's, this is important for startups to know, there's kind of a continuum of analysts. There are some that invented categories 30 years ago and are gonna die on those categories, right? They are not open as, you know, as people to new ideas. And those are the ones you need to know about and try to shape their thinking a little bit. But what the focus needs to be for a startup is the many, many, many analysts that are really open to new ideas, that are hungry to, to identify um, leading concepts, to start new categories, perhaps, to make their, you know, to claim their name on the space. So it's very important for startups to understand that there is this kind of continuum and work with the analysts that really will um, bring their objectives forward. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning of my introduction that I've worked in kind of startups, uh, you know, midsize and, and, yeah. and enterprise. And I think that that spectrum has been really valuable to me because you learn it's so easy to broad stroke very large industries and organizations, right? Like I worked at Oracle, 150,000 person company. Yeah. There are some amazing, fantastic, innovative, entrepreneurial people with inside Oracle, right? You just have to find the right kind of people uh, that that um, that you jive with. The problem, I think, historically with the analyst model is that it is uh, so expensive that startups immediately uh, like don't feel comfortable with it. And then, like, of course, to, to to Chris's point, there, you know what I mean. Like, there are analysts that are hungry to learn, and so you are able to do briefings and different things like that. But the problem is, is like, you know, from a from a time capacity, from from a like how many briefings you're allowed to do capacity. If you get the one, if you get the analyst that you just talked about, Robin, it's a fantastic experience, and you are excited and you feel like, okay, great. If you don't, um. You, you may not have the opportunity to find, you don't have the opportunity to to do the speed dating, so to speak, right? And so that's exactly. what I think that the, 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 the model, the way that it's constructed from its cost perspective, uh, from its like very limited briefings perspectives does not match the openness to the technological change that's happening and, and wanting to have an understanding on that. Totally, totally. And, and I, I know with my clients and Chris's clients actually, um, we do a lot of work in reading research and you know understanding analyst background to try to find those open analysts so we don't right. um, spend you know waste our clients time and energy with those that are not going to be receptive right so we'll yeah. find them for them and we gotta say um not all analyst houses are are equal there are very different players and we just yesterday we talked to uh, one of the top tier, um, sorry, the top three houses in in the world, uh, one of the top three largest houses, and they are specifically interested in tailoring their offerings to startups um, so that they fit better along the you know the, the growth journey of of startups, and they are very aware that they need to cater to their to the issues of startups in a better way than than many have done before. That's one point. So there's a lot of change happening in in the market, and Robin and I are working with some of those houses to improve this, uh, yes. backed by the CS survey, by for example, and all the good uh, information that we got out of comments and all of the data and, and that. And the other point is, um, it's not always the top three houses that you you know should only select. There's lots of tier two houses who might be even more specialized in your field of play who are very often a lot more flexible and a lot more open a lot more forthcoming with how you can use them and how you, you know you can align what you can get from them to the agility that you need in your journey so um i think there is a lot of education and guidance to be done in this space to direct the right startups to the right analyst firms to get the right type of value that they need at their specific point in the journey. So what you're telling us, Adam, is super interesting actually for uh, for us and and um, yeah and and another confirmation that we need to continue on that path. Yeah, well, you know, know, just just a just a quick point. 
um, people, almost everybody I talk to is, is very surprised to learn that the three names that most people know are only three out of about 1,200 analyst firms that are out there. So there's lots of opportunity for them to find the kind of analysts that will work with them. Well, and that's so, and that, and so when I, when I started the uh, uh, conversation saying that the model needed to be disrupt, obviously the analysts play a role in that, um, but the startups play a role in that as well too, right? And we have found fundamentally that a lot of startups that we talk to take a product out approach to company building, right? I had this problem personally, I solved it. I assume everybody else wants to solve it as well too, yeah. right? We always advocate that you should take a market in approach, which means that's great. What does the actual, like what actually exists in the industry? Are your differentiators actually any differentiated, right? And so as a, as a result of that, they're often thinking about uh, sort of the uh, outcome. Um, and I think that like they forget that there's two sides to the analyst. And, and the reason that everybody knows about the three that you're talking about is because if you get your name into one of those three from a, from a go-to-market perspective, from a reputation perspective, it's very strong, right? But again, that's the output, like the um, almost analysts as a media company, right? What 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 company what startups don't think about, which is actually what I think Chris's point is, is that they can be very valuable internally, like yes. uh, uh, absorbing the information, right? And again, but that's also like a little bit of the the cost dynamic that we talked about right. as well, right? Um, Some degree, yes. Uh, um, too, but but like right, so that's like I every startup, every company that I've talked to, pretty much all the way up to some of the biggest ones, are petrified of being placed in the wrong box mm -hmm. when it comes to uh, an analyst, right? And so they don't go to the analyst until they think they are fully formed and fully baked in what they want to do, right? And and my ex personal experience, having run analyst relations for a DNS company called Dyne, is that the earlier that I can bring my thinking into the analyst, that I can make that analyst feel as if they were part of the process, the much better my position is going to be in the end uh, because we actually had a relationship versus some sort of power dynamic of uh, me getting defensive about what I think versus them getting defensive what they think. Can, can I just that say, Adam, we so love you. That is so important. That is so important to understand that analyst relations is not a transactional thing where you say, I'm speaking to you and I'm maybe buying your time with me in order for you to say nice things about me. And therefore, I have to wait until I know exactly what I want you to say for me. No, no, no. That's not how it works. It is much more of an extension to your brain, to your team, um, an extension um, of all the insight that you can get from the market from someone who's leading maybe a thousand, a thousand five hundred, or two thousand conversations with your target audience all year round. So you get a much deeper perspective of what's going on in the market with your competitors, with your uh, target buyers, with potential partners, even with investors and all that. And you can bring all that information, all that insight into your development, into your go-to-market planning, into your strategizing and all of that so that you can accelerate your time to product market fit dramatically. And as Adam, as you say, and if you, if you um, bring the analyst into that journey early, they will build the, the confidence and the trust that they can mention you, your startup as a, as a, um, as a trustworthy player in the market, because they see that you know what you're doing, that you're being critical about yourself, that you're making adjustments, that you're moving the whole ship in the right direction. You know, it's a difficult journey. It goes up and up, ups and downs, and you know, sometimes to the left, to the right. But you're finding your way in an incredible way, and that development of trust and and confidence that they can actually speak about you without losing their own reputation. Um, is incredibly important. And that's entirely different from a transactional relationship where you're maybe buying PR time on, or, 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 or clicks on, on a website or whatever. So the understanding that is, is, is really important. I love that you, uh, what you, what you explained there. Yeah, exactly. I want to move us on to the next um, big topic because um, you mentioned that you've been um, uh, exposed to the analyst world way earlier than your work with, with York IE. 
Um, so Adam, how, how how did you actually personally learn about animals relations? When did your your company start working with them, and what were your personal learnings along the way? Yeah, so I actually um, I began the first part of my career as a journalist. Uh, I as a child growing up, I sort of uh, saw myself as the, the next Ernest Hemingway. Uh, but then it turned out that I wasn't very good at drinking or bullfighting. So it was not a, <laughs> not a practice, career. Practice, practice, <laughs> practice. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so um, after I um, I moved back to my native New Hampshire, um, I, I started working at a company called Dine, uh, which did the domain name system mm -hmm. um, and uh, came in there originally to write content because all companies are kind of publishing houses. Uh, and then in doing that, I said, hey, you know, somebody should be talking to the media because as, as a journalist, I understood what a good story was. So I started taking over the media relations. Then as we grew, we needed to talk to analysts. I, I grew over the analyst relations and really built out what people would say is the traditional kind of marketing communications function of the company. And it was really interesting because Dine uh, was a company that was founded in college. Uh, a couple of guys have founded it because they were in uh, Massachusetts. It was cold in the winter. Um, and uh, they didn't want to have to, this was before you could like print to a certain machine. You could be in the computer lab, but the printer was in another dorm building and you had to walk out in the winter. And so they figured out how to do the dynamic IP addresses. Um, but our fear as we grew that company to a hundred people, 200 people, 300 people was that DNS was too small. And so as we looked at the analyst community, there was no category for DNS, right? And so we spent a lot of cycles trying to evolve a bunch of different technologies into a category itself called internet performance management, right? So you have a uh, very established network performance management, you have application performance management. And then we were, we, our kind of argument was, well, the internet is essential. The public internet is essentially uh, a part of your, an extension of your network and should be nice. a category of itself. And so we did some of those strategies that we talked about. We had a very actually um, great conversations. Um, uh, one tip I think that we learned that is valuable is that, you know, when you're talking to an analyst firm, get multiple analysts that are in different sections on the same call so they can kind of hear it together and they can begin to see how like, okay, yes, I know I cover this space and you cover this space, but I see how you're thinking about it, even if it doesn't necessarily, you know, change the thinking, it, it's very helpful. But then I, and then ironically, um, we ended up getting acquired by Oracle uh, because we were the best DNS provider in the world and, and they were building out the Oracle cloud infrastructure and needed a DNS. So it was a lot of effort uh, to uh, to end up where we started, but it was a, it was a fantastic experience. Nice. But my guess is that the Oracle analyst relations team with about, I don't know, 25 or how many people? 60, they, 60, I think. 60 by now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they might have received a hint by, by someone in the analyst community possibly. <laughs> Well, and that's, you know, so and, and to our conversation that we just started with about really like the emphasis on analyst relations and the relation part of it, right? We talked about how the startups themselves can evolve the way that they think about their relationship with analysts. I think analysts have to also think about their relationship with startups differently. I think the analysts are very good at operating with an enterprise company like an Oracle who has a team of what you just said of 30, 60 people that are living and thinking about this and, and have the cycles to consume a, a 50 page, multi-page report, right? Uh, a startup is a completely, speaking to a founder uh, is a completely different language. Yes. And I think that, and, and Chris, you and, and Robin probably know better because you're more intimate with the, you know, what's new and happening in the analyst space. But mm -hmm. my suggestion is just like, we got, we got to think about how do you, there is a misperception that like kind of like market intelligence is like um, something that could be done once a year and you get a report, you get a snapshot and then you put it in a drawer and you try to survive Interesting. and yeah. it is a li living, breathing ecosystem that's changing daily. And when you think about things like uh, some of these big yearly reports and stuff, does that reflect that? Does that jive with that? And it's like, how do you make that information so that it's digestible and consumption uh, consumable, almost like your daily vitamin? Um, because you know, as a startup, you are iterating. You know, a large, a massive corporation. Their 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 iterations are 
you know, slow moving and over a period of time and, you know, they're, they're, they're huge, but a startup is making a thousand of those on a, on a weekly basis. And, pivoting. Yeah. Yeah, and, if they, and if, and if they're operating out of antiquated information, then they're going to be in trouble. Right. So it's, how do you, how do you think about that relationship? You know, you have a model that works really well with the enterprise and the way they consume information. What's the model for how you pass along that so that it is valuable to the startup and the, and the pace that they're moving at. That is so true. And I love your your comparison with the daily vitamin because a client of mine just told me, you know, we consider this almost like a gym membership. Right. If I just have the gym membership, nothing will happen, you know, but I need to go to the gym like every day or every other day. I, I need to, you know, exercise actually. And then my muscle starts to build and my fitness starts to grow. So um, just having it out there doesn't you know, well, not, and I'm so glad that you made that analogy because I think about that all of the that specific analogy all the time, and the 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 and you probably hear this with people as well too. It's always like nice to have versus must have, right? Like the the, the analyst, the 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 understanding, all of those different things, right? Because of the the time, and so you know you need to go to the gym, but what's the urgency? Right. What's the there's a beach party happening in a month. Yeah. <laughs> and that girl that I really like is going to be there. <laughs> and now I got to go to the gym. Right. What is that that gets those startups to realize or and really a lot of companies, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes it, it's it's if we are not mentioned or talked about, uh, it's more of a FOMO. Yeah. Uh, for yeah. like the, the larger companies. Right. But like what what like and it's something that, uh, you know, I would love as you guys to continue your conversations to just think through of like, how do we how do we make like uh, these early stage companies realize that this can't it's be. Not, it's not only early stage companies. What I found is once a company has an analyst access, you know, through a subscription or through some kind of commercial relationship, they have access to analysts for their research and for their for conversations. And I have found that most companies underutilize that in the sense that they either don't go to the gym at all, or they or they go to the analyst with a goal to impress them somehow or to present to them somehow. And what I what I'm always emphasizing with my clients is when you're sitting at your desk and you're trying to decide if you should go left or right. The first thought that you should have is, I wonder what the analyst thinks about this. And if you adopt that thinking, you know, wonder what an analyst can help me in terms of insight. And if you adapt that thinking, you start to really use your analyst relationships that you've invested in. You start to use that gym membership and get tangible, actionable insights that help your business. And by the way, if you get that those insights, it's completely fine to then say, okay, I considered this, but I'm still going to go the other way. They respect you know, because that. Because from what I my thinking is, it's just different. I took that advice and I took that perspective. I considered it. And when, after computing all that data, I decide for something else. That's entirely okay with the analyst. And it's even super interesting for them to learn about your your different decision and then what the outcome is and what you learn from it. So that's a perfect example of you know using that gym membership and exercise and and it's not just bring that knowledge in but do something with it and bring some feedback to the analyst community and thereby demonstrate your quality as management and your quality as a company and maybe that those guys can learn something from you. I, I, I think that is a huge thing, Chris, and I, I, I assume, Adam, in your experience, too, is that analysts never hear the, the, the outcome of their suggestions, and they have immense respect, even if you don't follow them, that you considered what they thought, that you strategize, it reflects so positively on you and helps relationships so much just to close loops and give them feedback on what you learned from their feedback. Yeah, and I, I, oh, I was just going to add one more thing. I also think what what I see happen a lot of times, and I think this becomes particularly uh, possible as companies scale and they begin to bring in specialists and different functions, right? Like I talked to a company the other day and they went through their marketing strategy and they had what they're going to do for social, what they're going to do for PR, what they're going to do for awards. And I said, well, that's sort of the tail wagging the dog, right? Like, what is the message 
of which you are going to then distribute through those different channels, right? And I think oftentimes people think about like, okay, analyst relations, like what, what's the story? What are we telling them? What are we doing this? And it's like, well, shouldn't that be just like a, like to our whole point, shouldn't they help you absorb or in, think about what that message and story that you want to distribute is, okay. and then just be one of the distributions channels, right? That is the challenge uh, for companies uh, right now, that they have a fragmented audience base uh, that consumes information in a variety of different places, and they and not to fall victim to having 70 different messages that you're sharing through 70 different channels, because you're never going to build brand equity or an identity around anything if you don't just say the same thing over and over again in multiple places. And if you're going to say the same thing over and over again in multiple places, you better damn well be confident that you are saying the right thing. Yes. And if you are going to be confident, maybe you should check with somebody that's thinking about that every single day. And also hearing the stories from your competitors or the messages from your competitors and hearing what customers want. Yeah, and somebody that's getting so calls from co potential customers like <laughs> that could also recommend you. Like it seems, you know, and I think it is just, I think your guys' work is super valuable because I just think it is, there's a lot of misperceptions. There are a lot of people that are just trying to survive and like keep the runway going of their business another day. And they don't, they don't have time to explore all of the nuances of this space. And so anything we can do to educate them, I think will be extremely valuable. Nice. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, and I think it's uh, it, uh, any analyst relations specialist can take a whole lot of um, capacity shortness out of that entire process and out of that gain for a startup specifically. Totally. And it's important to understand that as a startup, you don't need to do the entire analyst relations portfolio. It is so important because there's only so much, you know, you can chew and therefore better not bite off too much. Better be very selective and very strategic about what you bite off, so that you can actually chew it and and and, and swallow it, and um, and that is very important with startups to understand to be selective there and to make it effective and efficient. I realize we only have seven minutes, yeah. and um, I want to get to uh, some key questions. I mean, you've already shared, you know, in the, the, the how and why you're you're supporting your startups um, in your portfolio with analyst relations. Can, can you share a very short? Is there a success story or something that went spectacularly wrong, or um, something where where you you and the company have learned really a lot from? Uh, I think one good example of sort of this, like uh, you know, continued evolution of thinking about analyst relations in general is a company we work with called Auditoria. Uh, which does a lot of uh, automation for like back office finance, right? A lot of mundane tasks that you can free up your people to do. And I think they've done a nice job of both having the conversations with analysts, using that to um, kind of inform some of their decision-making. As a result of that, they were named to a, as a cool vendor, which is really positive. Right. But then also realizing that um, that they also have insights and um, and um, data and information, right? And they put out their own sort of state of automation report um, that then was able to get them a lot of coverage and, and sort of thought leadership as well too, right? And I think I think it's just a nice example of like um, of, of of using that uh, mindset. And I think if you have that right mindset, that you're not thinking so transactionally. And Chris, you mentioned it, right? Like the analyst relation is relation. It's not a transactional relationship. That 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 philosophy uh, should be true across the entire business, right? Especially when you think about software uh, and recurring revenue, right? Like nothing should be transactional. You should be playing the long game for all of those things, right? And again, that's difficult with startups that have a short runway of things. How do you, you know, do you have to survive today to, to be there for the, when the long game hits? But I think if you have that approach and you think about, um, um, you know, how you kind of uh, cultivate the true relationships, the true communities, it's going to be much more successful, both in the short term and the long term, which is the irony of it. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So I, I have one last question, if we can, because um, I think that was a great recommendation, Chris, for a startup we should talk to. Um, but the I, I think the last thing might, might be, what's your one big wish for this community, either from startups or from the analysts, that you'd like to see happen to make their relationship better and more beneficial? 
I mean, I think that we talked about it, which is like, uh, it's, it's frustrating because I think there is this clear need. All like early stage companies would be better if they took more of a marketing approach. And then there is this a group of people here that have some of that understanding and could be valuable. And there's just some thing uh, that's keeping them apart. I don't know if that's just uh, like a legacy. Uh, I don't know if that's the, the the financial model or the way that things are incentivized. Um, but if we could just take that barrier down, I think both the analysts would be better served because they would have a really good pulse on the evolution of the market and the dynamic and the changes. And then obviously the, the early stage companies would be as well too. So uh, that is my, that is my wish, but that feels a little bit like a, you know, a wish for peace and uh, <laughs> world hunger. Yeah, uh, exactly. We're on it. <laughs> well, that's it. That's good. Well, that's a good, good to very, it's incapable hands. So I feel, I feel very <laughs> passionate. About that. Yeah. We're, we're very passionate about this space and bringing this value to the startup world and the analyst world. Fantastic. So, well, and thank you so much for spending these uh, 30 something minutes with us um, on the call. I think that was hugely insightful. Um, we'll definitely uh, touch base with you on that uh, startup example that you mentioned and try to get them on the show if they uh, are up for that. That would be really in interesting. And I guess that, that concludes That's it for it. today. Thank you so much. Thank you for great, having me. And thank you thank for you all so the work much, you're Adam. doing. Yes, of course. Take care. Thank you. was rich with insights yeah i'm so glad you introduced us robin thank you oh yeah i absolutely loved adam's thinking and i, I loved your analogy about working with analysts being like going to the gym <laughs> yeah, I, I can't remember um where i first heard this but um it might have been andrew shu from spotlight maybe I don't know well adam called it their vitamins um which i also found quite fitting i'm say um but do you know what struck me again? Yeah, tell me. Um, he said, regarding that, that gym membership, he said uh, that startups do not see that compelling event to go to the gym. Mm -hmm. You know, that like that beach party where everybody wants to look good or so. Right. So it, in my experience, the, the number one threat to B2B tech startups um, is that comparable innovation is popping up everywhere around the world at roughly the same time, you know, at other startups, at innovation teams and large multinational corporations. And that is just because everybody tends to experience the same problems everywhere. And then there's the same technology available everywhere and that there are smart people everywhere. So um, what, once you have your bright new idea, your, your really your compelling event to go to the gym, if you will, is, that the difference between success and failure is all about making smarter decisions faster because if essentially it's a race and and i think adam nailed it by by saying you should make analysts part of your journey um, by engaging as early and as professionally as you can and and by using their insights early so uh, in fact i actually i see two compelling events so uh, one is uh, accelerating your product market fit uh, pmf and the second is reducing risk along that journey. You know, um, think of getting a better deal from investors and all that. You know, um, so I think it's no wonder, it's kind of, it's kind of no wonder that an accelerator or a venture capital firm like like Adam and and York IE just clearly knows that. But I think startups need to understand that too on a, on a broad scale. Oh yeah, that's so true. And I'm excited to support Adam and the team at York IE in the future. Yeah, yeah, they, they're just around the corner for you, aren't they? <laughs> well, that's from your angle, sitting across there in Europe. Well. So, so shall we announce we'll be next on the show? Oh, uh, wait, we need to see how the recordings work out, right? Well, then, dear audience, stay tuned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and please do let us know um, who you'd like to see uh, on the show. Um, maybe that's another startup or maybe that's an industry analyst firm who you've um, worked with, maybe even a specific analyst you've made good experience with, um, or maybe another investor, another accelerator firm in your country, maybe. Um, just let us know and we'll reach out. Exactly. You'll find our contacts in the show notes.
Great. Yeah. And with that, I would say thank you so much for listening. And we hope you have a great day. Thank you.